Hi, I'm Mike Gridley and welcome to Power Boat Television. Now you might wonder why we're in such a different spot for the opening of the show, but given it's 2017 and the birthday of Canada, 150 years, we thought we'd start here in Charlottetown in front of Provincial House where the Fathers of Confederation met in 1864 to discuss the creation of Canada. And straight ahead down to the harbor here is where the steamship arrived with the delegates on it and came up here to Provincial House. So we're gonna spend some time in Charlottetown and explore the waters around Prince Edward Island. Charlottetown is obviously a city deeply connected to its past. The architecture and vast number of buildings that have been protected and preserved in the city's core are impressive. As a tourism center celebrating Canada, and of course the island and its culture, the city thrives day and night throughout the summer. A focus point of culture and history in the heart of Charlottetown is the Confederation Center for the Performing Arts. We were fortunate enough to connect with Fraser McCallum for a chat. Confederation Center is a, a national memorial to the Fathers of Confederation and the founding uh, of Canada uh, that manifests as a national arts center. Uh, we do many, many things here. We've been here for 52 years, opened in 1964 by Queen Elizabeth II to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Charlottetown Conference of 1864, which was the first conference on Confederation, took place here in Charlottetown, just steps away at Province House. We are a living National Arts Centre, so we present uh, live theatre, live music, um, visual arts, performing arts, and heritage and arts edu education um, across this huge complex that is Confederation Centre of the Arts. We do that year-round um, for about a quarter million tourists and uh, islanders who visit through these halls. Every day, the ground around Province House and the Art Centre have reenactors to engage with and live concerts and more. <laughs> Having enjoyed some time in Charlottetown, it was time to get down to the real reason for coming east, boating, starting with Charlottetown's harbour. The waterfront is a mecca for tourists with shops, restaurants and pubs, tour boats and cruise ships visiting and of course a first-class marina for transients and permanent boaters alike. Our goal was to meet up with Robbie Craig, Jason Craig and Barbie Sear at Quartermaster Marine and go boating for the balance of the day. While not a big body of water is well protected, most boaters will start with a cruise along the waterfront. On this stretch you can catch everything from paddle boards to luxury yachts. For a quieter cruise, head up the West River past some of the historic waterfront properties. On both sides of the river, homeowners enjoy spectacular views and great water access. When conditions are right, locals flock to the shallows of Warren Cove in the entrance to the harbour from Northumberland Strait. The waters are shallow, great for swimming or just swinging on the hook. And if you're not sure where the cove is, look for the two range lighthouses. Our last tour for the day was to head out past the light and hug the shoreline into St. Peter's Road, heading for Nine Mile Creek. So why Nine Mile Creek? It's just a tiny harbour. Oysters, of course. Passing through this red building on shore are some of the best oysters that I can get in Ontario. Rodney's Oysters. Join us later in the show because we'll have more cruising from Prince Edward Island. Now we're in Montague, Prince Edward Island, where we've launched into the river here and are heading for the ocean and a cruise along the coast. While the crew were getting the boats ready, I sought out Andrew Rowe, who would be our on-water guide for the day. We're here at Montague Marina in the town of Montague the Beautiful. Um, population of about 1,900 people and the service centre for close to 15,000 people in eastern PEI. Um, we're a part of the Three Rivers region which, is, uh, which combines the Montague, Brudenell and the Cardigan River. Um, it's a great area for boating. We've got approximately 65 seasonal boats here and usually anywhere from 5 to 10 overnight visitors per night. Within minutes, we had cleared the marina with Andrew aboard, eager to spend the day showing us his local waters. 
the river is fairly wide and well marked. You can take your time or cruise at a comfortable pace as we did. The first section of the river runs about five nautical miles to Georgetown. The banks are low and sandy with many beaches, obviously enjoyed by the homeowners and cottagers alike. This area is definitely part of PEI's cottage country, with trees lining the shores between the cottages and the farms inland from the river. On the lower Montague, mussel farms begin to line both sides of the river. Because these waters are warm, an invasive species called tunicates have established themselves in the rivers. To protect the mussels, special boats and equipment have been developed to wash the tunicates off the mussels and socks. A non-stop job for multiple crews cleaning thousands of lines of mussels. We could soon see the open waters of Cardigan Bay, which meant Georgetown would soon be on our port side. Still an active port for the mussel farms and other fishing boats, albeit much quieter, the town has become a popular destination for boaters, cottagers, tourists, and us, of course. The small marina had room for visitors and the lobster boats work in these waters. Old sheds live on the waterfront alongside newer mussel and clam facilities. We enjoyed the walk through the village, taking in the local flavor, visually and ultimately physically, as we had to stop at clam diggers for some local fare. As we enjoyed the feed of clams, other visitors were wandering the flats in search of a clam. With lunch settled, we were off and cruising again, bound for Cardigan. Once clear of Cardigan Point and Shoal, we were into the open water. Once offshore, we changed heading to navigate to the McPhee Shoal and into the Cardigan River. This river seemed a little more rugged, with plenty of evergreens and eroded banks above low tide flats. Coming off plain, we were able to edge up to the flats to observe some hard labor. You ever wonder why you go into a restaurant and a meal of clams is so expensive, or you think it is? Take a look here, we're on the Cardigan River and how hard these guys have to work to dig out the clams so you can enjoy an excellent meal. Idling along past a few isolated cottages, we were treated to a rare sight that we tried to capture on video and stills. Several bald eagles were gathered at this bend in the river, training their young. Suddenly the surface of the river boiled with mackerel, and we knew why. Do eagles have a call for fish on? Leaving the spectacle behind, we arrived in Cardigan within minutes. While a small community, the marina was packed with working and recreational vessels but we did find some space for our two boats. Well, that wraps up another day on the water here in Prince Edward Island. Really enjoyed the cruise and the sights are spectacular. The villages are quite quaint, the people friendly. It's a great place to come and explore on the water by boat. If you've enjoyed this, join us again next week when we spend some more time on the water on Prince Edward Island. Hi, I'm Mike Gridley and welcome to Power Boat Television. This week on the show, we're continuing our exploration of some of the more popular boating destinations here in Prince Edward Island. Areas that attract the locals for the weekend, as well as tourists who bring their boats here to the island. Now we're here in Stanley Bridge to start a tour of this local area. And as much as I'd love to go out in this wonderful fishing boat, we will be taking our express cruiser back out onto the water to show you some of the sights. Well, actually, we had planned to start the show cruising out of Summerside on the island's south shore to explore the coast of Northumberland Strait and, of course, tick the cruised under the Confederation Bridge box on my list, but no go. Wind and waves put an end to that. They were eight feet in breaking over the seawall on Indian Spit and forecasted to build. So after a brief tour of the one-of-a-kind Silver Fox Curling and Yacht Club, we headed across the island seeking the lee shore and launched on the Stanley River in Stanley Bridge, an active fishing harbour. We first headed upriver to tour its sheltered waters. The river is lined with rolling farmland dotted with homes, several resorts and cottages, both private and rentals. In the river, large areas are utilized to cultivate mussels. Local boaters enjoy the river's warmer waters and anchoring out to swim and relax in the shallows. After a fast cruise down river, we passed through Stanley Bridge and headed along the widening river out into New London Bay. With the area's proximity to Cavendish, travelers were find numerous options for rooms, like the Inn on the Pier, a great spot to launch your boat or rent one. 
Heading across the bay, we can now clearly see the sand dunes of Prince Edward Island National Park off Cavendish Beach. The dunes form a barrier across New London Bay, providing shelter from the ocean waves for boaters and the ever-present mussel and oyster farms. And speaking of oysters, the bay is home to Raspberry Point oysters. These are oyster cages over here. Uh, this is Raspberry Point oysters. You can find Raspberry Point oysters in every major fine restaurant in Canada and the U.S. They ship them out of here by the tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. In the wintertime, they, they have these, these shallow, specially made shallow boats that to take the crates out uh, and the trays out. And in the wintertime, they come out with chainsaws, literally come out on four wheelers. And so they just lift the tray right out of, that's uh, it. out of the racks? Yeah, take it over, ship it out. Ship it out, bring another one back for, uh, for growing the next batch. 12 months a year. I mean, after, after five or six years of growing, of course, so. As we moved along the oyster cages, we caught up with a crew harvesting oysters that were happy to show off the local product. Back underway, we ran along behind the dunes and marveled at their length and height. Gord proved to be not only a knowledgeable tour guide, but an excellent navigator. Over time, due to wind and waves, as well as major storms, the sands above and below the waterline shift and new channels are created as the old ones fill in. So you have to weave through the markers around sandbars and shallows to exit the bay or to turn back in for the French River. Being low tide, we had quite the welcoming committee wading around in the shallows. Cruising past the fishing wharfs and lobster boats, we were presented with more mussel farms on both sides of the river. So this is uh, French River, and these are mussels grown on socks, put little spats, little small little mussels, laid out here to grow for the next, you know, for two or, th two or four years. They basically come by, pick them up, take them off, take them to the plant around the corner, and that plant ships out half a million pounds of mussels every week. That's an amazing amount of mussels when you see, mind you, how many places we've been where you just see bed after bed after bed. Well, so. when you think about how many people order mussels in restaurants across North America, a pound <laughs> of mussels in an order, so that's we, we can feed a half a million orders a week. Welcome back to Prince Edward Island as we cruise into South Landing on the French River. We had decided to see if there was any activity on the wharfs, and like most places you go with Robbie Craig, he knows someone there. These guys had just returned from a fishing outing with a 130-pound halibut to show for their efforts. After a slow pass of the fleet, it was past time to head offshore for a special view of the Cavendish Dunes. So once again, we made our way through the markers and sandbars and along the sandy shores past the lighthouse and through the gap onto the open Atlantic. Cruising offshore and gazing back to Cavendish's sand dunes and beaches is a special sight. I've camped in Prince Edward Island National Park and explored the dunes and beaches, but the view from the water is exceptional. The dunes stretch over two nautical miles across the bay and rise some 40 feet above the water. If you go ashore, the flat beaches make for an easy walk along the dunes. Where the dunes meet the shore, the beaches begin and you can catch views of the campground in the park. The red sands of Cavendish Beach and the National Park are unique and have been highly popular for generations. As you cruise along the park shoreline, which extends 37 kilometers from New London Bay to St. Peter's Bay, the sand beaches give way to red sandstone cliffs. Like the beaches in the dunes, these soft cliffs are subject to erosion from the waves and winter storms as well. After a spirited run along the cliffs, we headed into Rustico Harbor to stretch our legs and check things out. Once a busy fishing harbor, Rustico's location now makes the community a tourist attraction for visitors to the National Park, Cavendish Beach, and Green Gables. Boats still operate from the harbor, so you can purchase many varieties of fresh seafood. You can also join a charter to fish for your own, or just skip the fishing and cleaning and have your seafood prepared and served to you.
Visitors can also get in a little shopping and tour the fishing museum or take a stroll to see some of the waterfront homes and cottages. Rested and refreshed, and with the afternoon winding down, it was time to return to Stanley Bridge. What was the rush? Well, after a day of mussel, oyster, and halibut sightseeing, we had to make it back before Car's Market closed so we could select some clams and mussels and shuck a few oysters for ourselves. Gord, after being out there today and seeing all those oysters being farmed and all that, it's great to come to shore, wrap up the show here with trying some oysters. So what's the best way to shuck these oysters? Yeah, the best way to shuck these oysters is, to, the best way to eat an oyster is at home or on the wharf. You yeah. know, people eat them in the restaurant. So these are, these are still alive. They're alive till you pop, and it's done. So you pop them, slice off the top, get this little muscle down here. And it's ready. There you are. Excellent. Pat, enjoy, and see you again next week. Mm. Oh, that is wonderful. That is so fresh, you want to do those salty. Again? You can't do them. <laughs>